nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So anyhow, let's move on to the, to the uh, presentation for today. And today what we're gonna look at is chemical vapor deposition. And that's like a big word, like a pronoun. It could mean like so many things and so many separate, you know, cousins, brothers, sisters of the same type of technique. But I'm going to go over a lot of the foundational parts. And what I wanted to do is contrast this in like maybe two distinct ways. There, there's when we use CVD, two of the most popular ways that we could use those are for, uh, one dimensional materials, whoops, oh. one dimensional materials. And that means that we're gonna make something that looks like a nanowire or a nanotube. We're gonna make like hairs. And that's very interesting because those types of materials are kind of like a specialty material because they're really not in your like cell phone or your computer, but they're really good for things that are like solar cells or biomaterials or other applications like that, sensors. If you would look at a nano wire, because it's a wire, for its size, it has a lot of surface interaction. So that way, it's like a dog with a really big nose, right? It could really sniff things out really well for you. Or like a solar cell, the incoming light, it would have a high capture ratio that we would be able to get energy out of a finite limited area. And, and all solar cells have to do that. So the nano wires and then nano wires and nano mesh, I don't know if I, I think I might have it in this presentation, but I chopped it down. I forget the applications I have here at the end, but we could do things like make like a nano mesh and we could use them biologically to put on things like burns. And it gives like a, a, like a foundation for cells to root onto so that they could form like new skin. And then things like silicon are, are bioabsorbable, so you don't have to remove it. It'll kind of like go away like those stitches that they don't have to take out. So th those things are kind of pretty cool to, to know about. So uh, their, their application, you know, I don't think you're going to go to Walmart today and buy nanowires, but they are very useful. The one that you could go to, to Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, or part, uh, most places that sell you know, things other than food, you can get two dimensional materials and they come from a CVD. And those things would be like saran wrap. So on, the, uh, I, I should have said mathematically, let me go back to 1D. 1D has one dimension, like the length is more than 100 nanometers or so. Then the, the, the whatever you want to say, so that would be the Z direction. The X and Y direction are below 100 nanometers. So like a hair, and the hair could be as long as you want it to be, but the, but the, you know, the diameter of it is, you know, under, makes it on a nanoscale. And the two-dimensional material, that's different that we would have like the X and Y or as big as we want them to be, but the Z, the thickness is nanometers. And so that would be like in some ways in, in saran wrap or aluminum foil is not, you know, nanometers at all. But that's what we're looking at is like, you know, a piece of saran wrap and it could be conformal. And maybe to extend that, that could be like the coatings that we have on things like sunglasses or on like I have a big picture window here and it has like UV coatings on it. So my furniture doesn't bleach out inside the house. So we, we would look at two-dimensional coatings and like I just had a knee implant and I didn't look at my particular one because I didn't want to be creepy about it but a lot of times they put uh you know wear uh films on materials like that so that they wear less so for example if you get away from like the knee subject you can make like a two-dimensional material like a thin film and they often put things like silicon nitride I mean I'm sorry Oh, I can't think of the name. Isn't that something? It's if you would go to Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, and you can go buy dr uh, drill bits and they're gold colored. So what they do is, is they actually put on this thin film coating and what it does is it lubricates it and then it doesn't wear. And for the life of me, now that totally escaped me. Oh my, that's something. I think that's from being tired. 
So we're looking at the, these, these coatings. So they don't have to be on sunglasses. They could be on car pistons. And certainly they're used quite a bit in semiconductor films and some semiconductor deposition. If I would say one of the bad things about just looking at CVD, whoops, looking at CVD on the get-go, we don't drive the, you know, to get work done, you need energy. So what would be the driving force or force is in CVD? And, and the thing that would drive it the most is temperature. And then we would have our chemical affinity to, to, to certainly do the work too. So there's a chemical gradient in there that's gonna do some work for us. But you know, that's really initiated by you know, temperature like E to the KT. So the, the drawback to P, the, the CVD is probably temperature. We could, in some senses, extend this discussion to a subset of, of CVD, like I said, like a cousin. We can do PECVD, which is plasma enhanced, where we would put electrical bias across there. And what that would do is we would substitute like thermal temperature for electrical energy. And then that would be a lower, you know, maybe under 200 degrees C temperature. And that would be a lot more conducive to doing depositions or growth on polymers. So this, this is, tends to be, if I would look at, you know, I always like to look at like, what's the advantages and disadvantages of some type of application. This one would be a little bit, you know, just tip of tongue. Uh, it would be difficult for temperature. That would probably be the thing that would pop in my mind the most. So again, we're going to look at two modes of operation and rather rudimentary systems with under this umbrella of this, this title. And so we're going to look at making uh, nanowires and thin films. So the nanowires is called VLS and thin films are called VS processing. And we'll get to that. So this is our, you know, short overview. And even before I start, I like to, you know, just have a discussion to get everybody framed into what we're talking about today. So what we're going to do is have a short overview of what, what we're talking about, which I already did a little. And then I'm going to look at typical systems. And, and, and it's funny that the design of the systems works around, interestingly, the temperature. So if we were to do rather high temperature processing, you need for your material, when you look at the material, you have to say, what's going to happen to my material on this machine? And if we're going to a temperature that's like, I don't know, 800 degrees C or 1,000 degrees C, that's really crazy hot because it's like 1.8 plus 32. So we can just say times two. So if I'm doing like 800 C, it's like 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like bizarre temperatures, right? Does everybody see that? That stuff is like crazy. So a problem that we would have by analogy is, and, and, and even if you were to make like say brownies in your oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, which would be like 180 Celsius or whatever it is. If I would burn them, forget about them, you know, the dog runs away, go get the dog, come back. My burning, my brownies are burnt and smoking. If I threw those in a sink and put hot water in right away on my glass Pyrodex dish, it probably would like explode and crack and crumble. Does everybody see that? So when you apply heat and like it didn't crumble when I put the brownie mix and put it in there because I ramped up the temperature slowly and then I would take it out and let it cool and then everything's okay. But rapid changes in temperature and when you look at like large changes, you need a long time to stabilize your material. Does that make sense? So maybe for example, to tell a long story here in the beginning, we might have to do a deposition and CVD for thin films and it might take a number of hours. You really can't make like one wafer in hours because then your fab's gonna have to be as big, you know, just your CVD section is gonna have to be as big as a Walmart because your throughput's gonna be really low. So we look at the design of the machine, it revolves around the high temperature the long time to do the process and how do we still make money? And that's manufacturing. 
So I look at a lot of things in, in how I teach is we have these issues, which is making money and making a really good product. And I like to pose those questions to the students. And then we examine the physics of how to answer that in an economical viable solution. And I think that's how businesses approach nanotechnology. So that's what we're, that's how we're looking at it today. So, and then to learn, I think you, you just can't be told something. You have to have a question in your mind, right? So that's Socratic teaching, right? So Socrates didn't say anything. He just asked loaded questions like, where's all this money coming from? I think I'm going to have, they're going to raise taxes later on. So those kind of things, which will get you in trouble. Does everybody see? So they made him drink the potion. How about it? I think it's interesting. You know, Socrates, they said, hey, you know, you're really respected. We don't want to rock the boat, but we have to do something with you. And we're really going to come over and uh, put you to death. And we're going to give you a month to run away. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to stay here, buddy. And so he did, you know, but he was older, et cetera. So maybe he had other medical issues or something. I don't know. But I think the dude's cool. He was like, bring it on. So they're like, I'll give you a month head start. And he's like, I'll be here drinking tea. <laughs> they gave him a different tea, right? So I think that's cool. So, so hats off to some guy that's been dead for a zillion years, right? So there's the Socrates, uh, uh, Socratic uh, teaching and the lessons from that. And then what we're going to do is we'll segregate it and look at top down, which is the one that's most popular and certainly you know, all about your cell phone, right? And your computer, your sunglasses, you know, coatings on whatever lenses on your cars, you know, for so they don't oxidize and stuff like that, you know, like your headlights and, and things like that. So th those coatings are like uber, uber popular. And I was telling the students the other day, there's a real popular company here in uh, State College. They make uh, chemical characterization equipment and they do chemical characterization of materials like, you know, gasoline or food or all kinds of stuff or medicines, and they certify things. But they had to make containers that are inert that don't interact with things so that they can get the data, not, not examine the container. So their experts are doing these inert coatings. And then they started doing things like coating nuts and bolts and like pistons and stuff and things for like underwater drilling and oil things that are quite corrosive and aggressive, you know, with like sulfur and stuff like that in it, medical devices, and they spun off that company. So basically they deposit silicon dioxide and silicon nitride on things like bolts. And you could see that in your automobile, you look at like screws and they look like gold colored, or you look at them and they're gold colored and they kind of look like they have a rainbow on them, like oil. And those would have like an oxide nitride coating on them and they're, they're relatively very inert. So these things are, they're all over the place and you wouldn't examine it, you know? So, so, so from, you know, sunglasses, the prosthetic devices, cell phones, the car parts, the oil refineries, things like CBD are like critical and crazy. And that company is called Silco Tech. And then the, the chemical analysis company is called ResTech. And Penn State's a hell of a place to work and, and everybody knows that. And, you know, there's a lot of money and good retirement and things like that. But actually th those companies are, are named a, a better work environment than the university. So in, in my county, that's the probably number one place to work or, or so it's said, you know, or polls or whatever. And I know people that work there and I say, it's a really nice company, you know, and, 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 and a lot of the whatever, Politics is minimized. I guess that's the hardest part of any company, right? You know, interaction kind of stuff. So they're fairly flex flexible and let you wear jeans and everything, make you a little bit more comfortable. So they're, they're a good company and I have students that work there. And the students, you know, I see them once in a while or whatever, it sheets, and they tell me how they like it and stuff like that. So that's a really neat thing. So, you know, to talk about more than just, you know, the presentation, really why is this stuff important? So we're not talking about things that are just, you know, academic or math, mathematics or a good lesson. And th these have that in there, but you know, it, it's really, this is a, uh, you know, highly used and you wouldn't, you know, probably expect 
to, to see how many things are made with CBD when you examine or the importance that they do. Because that company doing like, you know, they do qualification of like diesel fuel and medical, you know, pharmaceuticals and all that. It's really important to have that done in society. And, and this, this, this CBD method is a driver that allows these tests to be really well done, you know? So I think that that's cool. So we're, like I said, we're gonna divide and conquer like good engineering. We're gonna do 2D materials, which are the thin films, kind of like saran wrap and they're conformal and they could be like sunglasses or binoculars or something like that, or you know, certainly levels and stuff in your cell phone, right? And then the 1D materials, uh, and again, sorry, whoop, the, 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 we call this VS growth. So it's vapor to solid growth. And then the VLS, which is the nanowires, there's an intermediate L in there, it's liquid. So that's interesting. And just looking at the words, what do they mean? Well, the VS method is universal across the substrate. The whole substrate is deposited uniformly, like a layer of saran wrap. Nanowires, when you examine them, they grow like hairs. So there's something that grows and then to adjacent to that, like your scalp or whatever, it, it's not growing. And then there's another hair and then it doesn't grow. And then there's another hair. So in some senses we can describe that as localized growth. It's not growth across the entire substrate. It's limited growth in certain well-defined areas. So, if you think about it, how would we do that or what words would be appropriate? Well, a good scientific word would be catalyst because what it does is increase the rate of reaction. Does that make sense? So what we're gonna do with VLS is we're gonna apply little dots of catalyst and wherever the catalyst is, that's where the wires are gonna grow. How about that? So what we do is this intermediate step where in VS, we start with a blank substrate that's barren, and then we do our deposition. But with VLS, we shoot it with the polka dots. And the little polka dots, each one is a catalyst. And then therefore, the rate of reaction is quicker at the catalytic area than the surrounding area. Does that make sense? And that's how we can have hairs grow, but not everything grow. And that's the difference between the two. The, the first one is, you know, universal across the whole substrate. The second one is localized with the catalyst. So really, like when I start and even go through the outline, I like people to know where the hell we're going. So that's the whole presentation there. How about it? So that's what we're going to learn to do in detail. And so now we can look at, I think the interesting, now I think it makes you interested how, how this is done. And we can look at the hardware and all that other stuff and how it's crafted, I think it's like really neat. You know, it's a solution to a problem. So now we have a goal, which is a legitimate goal to make these high efficiency sensors or to make these conformal coatings. And, and certainly money wise, it's a good goal. And, you know, and, and certainly GNP, you know, gross national, pro a lot of things are made with CBD, you know, so there's a lot of income with this and a lot of jobs. So I think it's interesting. So the term CVD generally applies to a process that converts some precursor gas or gases into material that's deposited onto a substrate. And that's certainly true. I can extend that, but I don't want to confuse people too much, but let me put up some parentheses or air quotes. We could also do this in some senses in a liquid. So we could use not just a gas phase, we could do deposition and then we could do a liquid that has material suspended in it and that liquid could apply material. So for example, we could grow nanowires in a liquid solution given that we have a catalyst. Does everybody see that? But like just for this one, I wanted to, to, to look at the vacuum equipment because certainly that's how most of 2D CVD is done. But we have things and you guys know like electroplating and if you wanted to, in some ways, extend that idea, I could probably say, if you bought me a coffee or something, I could say that electroplating is like CVD. 
maybe, maybe not. But if you bought me a coffee, I'd be all in. Does everybody see that? So that, that that's all good. So I, I just wanted to point out that it, you know, it can extend, like I said, there's like the core thing, and then you could have like a sister or brother to it or a cousin. And that's what's nice about these foundational things. When you look at things that are new later on, they're not new. They would just be an extension of these fundamentals that we're going to go over today. So I, I think that that's really good. So this system that we're looking at specifically here, we're looking at this conversion of this gas into a solid, and we're going to drive it by temperature. And I put in red there for my presentation. Boy, you know, people like to go to flexible substrates and do things on plastics and all that other kind of stuff now. So that's, uh, you know, the CVD thing has that, you know, that that's like, you know, the whatever, the white elephant in the room. You're like, but temperature, you know, you could sell this, but if you wanted to coat like, a, you know, like the headlight on a car, so they have them plastic lenses now. And the lenses themselves made out of that polymer, they usually get foggy after about five years. So it might be a good idea to put like a real thin glass layer on top of that because it's transparent and glass is inert. And then maybe that would make those last longer and not be so foggy. So that would be a good way to do it, but it's, you know, your lens material, that protective thing on the car or truck, if you put it in it like, 400 degrees C or something that would melt. So then you would have to go to a cousin of this PECVD. Does that make sense? So the one thing is when we're looking at this, that heat thing is, is always like, that's a little bit of a, it's, it's always an issue. It always limits where we could use this. And again, we could do plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, a cousin of that. And then we would be able to lower the temperature threshold to room temperature plus a hot cup of coffee or tea. Today, oh, today it's an empty tea cup because I just finished my tea. So it's, it's, you know, tea, whatever water boils at 100 degrees C, room temperature is like 23 or something like that. And plasmas are, are usually like hot coffee and room temperature put together, you know, in and about that. So those, those things are kind of conducive because we could make them in, I don't recommend it, but you could make them in maybe plastic, you know, mugs or something like that. I don't, I don't like to heat things in plastic that much. I always get paranoid. It's going to give me cancer or something. So I, I, I'd, I'd rather heat things in like glass pyrodex than, than Tupperware, you know, because I know that it's said that some of these things aren't so good, like this water bottles, they might leach out different things, you know, so I, I'm a, I'm, rather cautious about that stuff. If you can avoid things that are questionable, avoid them. So there you go. So we're, we, we do these at low pressures. So we generally do these at vacuum, the CVD operations. And what that allows us to do is follow a pattern. It's even like a carpenter building a doghouse. If you say to a carpenter, I'd like you to build me a dog house in 20 minutes, it's probably not going to be so square and there might be a little crack here or something might line up or whatever, a little bit off, right? Because it's done too quickly. But if you said to a carpenter, hey, how about this morning or today, could you build me a dog house? He's going to measure everything twice and check everything out. And that dog house is pretty gonna be styling and no little cracks and holes in it and it'll be pretty symmetric. So if you give things or manufacturing enough time, it'll fill in the right area. Does that make sense? We're gonna have like voids that we need to fill in. And those voids is a big part of this presentation. The voids in the material as you grow it look really sexy to the incoming atom because they have the most bonds and the most energy. So if you give it enough time, it'll fill in these little potholes. But if you don't give it enough time, it might bridge over that and make it like porous and have defects. Does that make sense? So the pressure thing running under vacuum, what we're gonna do is it's like to the carpenter, we're only gonna feed him so much raw material per hour. 
so that he can do the best job with it. Does that make sense? So we're gonna regulate the growth mode. So LPCD itself is a widely used chemical vapor deposition tool that could be used for bottom up, which we would consider nanowires, or maybe we would say gas depositing on the surface would be maybe more look at top down, depending on how you would define those, those, those uh, types of subsets, right? And the lower pressures control the reactions so that we're trying to make things not haphazardly. We're trying to allow the natural progression like the, step, but like the puzzle pieces, we're allowing them to fit together nicely. We don't wanna apply a puzzle piece and then not snap it into place. Does everybody see that? And the more rapidly we, we would do that, the puzzle pieces wouldn't snap into place. So we wanna give it a little bit of time. So that's why we use, we use the limited amount of, of gas input and that allows that to happen. And then at the same time, when we're doing the, when we're doing the, the temperature, the temperature is making things go, it's, it's allowing the add atom to find that hole. It allows it to bounce, bounce around rapidly like a dog sniffing around to find the right place, right? So it sniffs around and finds the right energy hole. Does everybody see that? So at, when you do a deposition, an add atom comes down onto the surface and it like bounces around. Most likely it leaves. You wouldn't think that. But it looks around, you set up the energy that it will leave if it doesn't find binding energy. So it can only have a reaction if there's some kind of threshold of energy. Add atoms come down, they don't have an energy to make a bond because it's not where you want it to make it, they leave. Add atom comes down and finds like a hole and there's a lot of energy there. And it says, yeah, I wanna be here. And it fills in the hole. So we'll see that later in a drawing. Maybe that's a question right now. I, I'm trying to do an explanation or some hand waving, but that's a question and the pictures will help that in a little bit. So heat is used to initiate the reaction. And then we look, that's the Arrhenius equation, you know, E to the KT. So, you know, this, this, this chemical reaction is helped by exponentially with Boltzmann's constant thrown in there with the temperature, right? So that's really cool. And then when we do deposition, we're probably gonna do for like vacuum guys or whatever, we're probably gonna do hundreds of millitor, like a thousand millitor, 2000, 500 millitor, because what that's gonna do is give us a large flux or a large population of add atoms. Does that make sense? And, and then I always refer to that, like on my, on my incoming thing is like just capital C, you know, that's my, that's my growth species. And when I'm in a vacuum level, you know, it's just like a perspective, like how fast is a car going on a highway? You know, you'd say 70 miles an hour or something like that. So when I look at things like tor or millitor or thousands of tor, because I work in vacuum, they kind of make sense to me. So what I'm saying, when I'm saying like hundreds of millitor, that's really rich. That's a lot of material in the vacuum world. That, that's, that's healthy, you know? That's like really hot, hot, hot wings. Does everybody see that? That's like super hot wings. So, you know, you have to just like judge it. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot. So comparatively speaking within some perspective, you know, and this is just abstract, just like an opinion or whatever. When I look at it, I'm like, those are really hot, hot wings, you know? And I'm like, that's a lot of, that's a lot of ad atoms, but we want to do it at a regulated fashion. Does that make sense? And interestingly, and this is a really good point, the deposition time that we take to put like a layer on sunglasses or whatever, so you wanna have like blue sunglasses or whatnot, the time that it takes to do that is usually minutes. The deposition is minutes, but to put it in the furnace and take it out is hours. 
So that's kind of weird because the time itself is not really the, the the manufacturing time is not limited to the deposition time. It's equal to the dominant factor would be the thermal stress. And that's like a takeaway and you can't get around that. You know, that's the physics. Well, we can, we're going to trick Nate. We're going to trick nature and we're still going to get dozens of wafers in an hour. Because if we couldn't, somebody else somewhere else is going to figure that out and put us out of business. So machines in nano manufacturing, for the most part, and this isn't entirely true, but a, a macro idea like making your cell phone or an iPad or whatever, uh, you have to do dozens of wafers in an hour or you're going to go out of business. Or that, that, that thin film or that particular step is usually only minutes. You really can't have steps that are ours. And this step is ours. So we got to figure that out. So let's look at this, this LPCV itself. So we generally are under, a, uh, under like a medium vacuum. And what this does is it gives us high diffusivity of the material, uniformity, and it gives us like a finite amount of time that we're able to place the atoms in the place we want them to be. So we're given enough time to do this in, in, in a high care fashion that everything is uniform. And that's very important. And, you know, that's like a, you know, that's like a discussion, like I'm talking about my dog or something. In textbooks, they don't do that. They just say, this is this math and that. But in really, that's what you're looking at. I mean, the, the end result is, why are we doing that? Why we're doing that is, like I said, we want to have time to have the puzzle pieces snap into place. And if we don't do that at the appropriate time, we're going to have a crappy material. Like your sunglasses are going to peel or whatever. And you can't have that. Does everybody see that? Especially if you're doing like, a biomaterial like a knee. Does everybody see that? Or you're selling drill bits, it's titanium nitride. I couldn't think of that. Titanium nitride is the gold colored material that is on drill bits. They put it on scissors. I've seen like gold colored scissors and they'll say like titanium nitride and stuff. And they put that on rifle parts. They put that in car engines and it's really slippery and it, and it makes like a drill bit last like five times as long. The most expensive thing to make when you make an automobile engine is the drill bits. The cost of the drill and the, the, cutting, the cutting implements. And when you coat titanium nitride on the, on the cutting implements, the cutting implements last like five times longer. Plus they don't lose tolerance right? Because they're not getting smaller, smaller as they wear down. So your engines are better. So to be honest, in some ways, when you look at it from a manufacturing aspect, when you look at titanium nitride coated, uh, you know, cutter bits, if Toyota adopts that, and whatever other brand Ford doesn't, then Ford's at a real disadvantage because Toyota can lower their price point and probably with a better product. So everybody's forced to that level. So I have a nice tool shop downstairs. I actually trained as a pup to be a machinist. So, you know, I, lo I love that stuff. I love working on a weekend and whatever, you know, fixing my tractors or sharpening the blades on my mower deck and stuff like that. So, but you know, when I go to look at stuff and it's titanium nitride, I'm like, Bob, put that in my cart because it's just better stuff. Does everybody see that? And, and those things are, are, are really, really what we need to do, you know? So it makes things better. So this reaction is not limited by the gas, but it's limited to the temperature. So what we're doing is we're able to control the rate of reaction so that we have a really good product. And that's, you know, easier said than done in nanotechnology because we're doing stuff atoms at a time. 
So this is an interesting, eloquent solution to a really big problem. The thing that I put in red here is, and I said many times before, the recipes themselves can take hours. So the solution here, this is like the punchline to the joke. We don't do one wafer or one substrate or one you know, phone screen at a time. We do 100 at a time or 200 or 300. So if it takes a few hours and I have hundreds in there, I'm still getting 100 per hour. And I'm still able to do so many substrates in a minute. Does everybody see that? So the assembly line, you know, like making a Ford Model T, you know, the thing that bothered Mr. Ford was the slowest process and how to keep that process at the same rate as the other processes. So these Model T's and Model A's were just flowing out of the factory in Detroit, right? So in manufacturing, we have to have a way to make our, you know, our particular recipe or that thin film or that in minutes. And doing this by batch processing, which means putting in a bunch at a time. It'd be like my wife at Christmas. You know, she makes these big cookie sheets with a bunch of chocolate chip cookies on there. So we're getting a bunch in an hour. She's not like putting in one cookie on one sheet. She'd be there for weeks. Does everybody see that? So she's making these cookies in parallel. And that's what we do with these reactors. So the reactor is a furnace tube and the furnace tube is heated with coils around it. And what that does is it heats the walls of the furnace tube, which is nice because we don't get, we, we limit the condensation on the walls on the tube. Because when, we're, when we put our material on our wafers or substrates, whatever you want to call them, that's fine. But then we pull them out and we put in another batch. And then we pull them out and we put in another batch. All the time we're heating and cooling the furnace. And we have layers of this thin film on there. Sooner or later, it's going to crack because of thermal stresses, because there's always interfaces and heat and cool, heat and cool. It's like getting potholes in the highway, right? In the winter. So LPCVDs actually do have a lot of contamination from this process, but we do minimize it because the walls are heated. So we don't get that much condensation on there. But if somebody walked up to me and said, Hey, what's a big pain in the butter? What, what are you worried about with an LPCVD? I would say particulates from delamination from residual coatings. Kind of like looking at a bridge that's 100 years old that it's been painted 50 times. It'll usually be flaking off in different places, right? So that might be an issue. So then naturally we have to have statistical process control, clean up those tubes before they become an issue. We have to have characterization to look at particulates. And then we have to have methodologies to get rid of particulates if they are on a substrate. So, you know, these issues aren't just issues. They always come with resolutions. And that's really what's interesting about studying manufacturing or nanotechnology. You know, they're like solving a crossword puzzle. Pretty, pretty interesting, you know, because they're challenging. They're like, you know, here's this issue. How do you solve it? And it's always, I think that the solutions are, you know, they're just interesting. They're entertaining. So I, I, think, I think engineering in general is entertaining. I, I really like it. You know, I like a lot of things. So chemistry and heat are balanced to provide this uniformity across the substrate and the batch. So when you look at this, and let me get my draw thing out, which I, I'm terrible at. Let me use, oh, this purple looks like crazy Stalin to me today. So here's where my gas goes in. So let me make that thicker. My gas is going in here. And then here's my, my first wafers in this zone right here. And then here's my last wafers. And if you take a minute, and I don't have time because I'm trying to rush through this presentation and tell you all I can. 
But when we look at this, we can we can probably do a model like this. And we could say here at the beginning of my process, I have a lot of gas. And as I do the deposition, my gas is used up. Maybe I should have a thinner one here. Oh, and then it, I should like learn how to use like an iPad and a pen or something. Cause this draw thing that they have in zoom, I can't use that well. They probably have like a simple instruction set, but I'm a man. So I'm forbidden from reading instructions, right? I'd rather suffer through not being able to use it than to do that. So then I'll have to have my wife or daughter or something read the instructions and then tell me, and then I'll know how to use it. But till then, I refuse to read the instructions. So I always just cuss it. That pen doesn't work well for me. It's because I'm not doing it right. And I'm bullheaded because I'm a guy. So our gas has a gradient. So now we're going to think our first wafers are going to be thicker than our last wafers. A big, big story in nanotechnology, you have to have uniformity and predictability. So this is taboo. So we're looking at it and we're saying, hey, temperature makes me do more than one wafer at a time because I want to do a batch system. But when I flow in the gas, I got issues because if I float in from one end, I get this I get this gradient. And if I flow them in at different points, I get like whirlpools of chaos and that could even be worse. So, so even multiple inlets you think might be a valid solution that could get a little squirrely really quick. So how do we solve this? Well, here, let me go to another color so I can differentiate it. Where's my... Oh, where's my mouse thing? I, I don't even see them now. There's usually a pen or a thing. I don't see nothing. I just have to follow the line. Let me just X out of that, maybe. You can't see, oops. So let me do get that back up again. Cause it, it got, it actually got funky. That's cause I was cussing at it, I guess. It got funky. Let me do clear, clear the drawing. Let me redraw that here a second. So I'm gonna draw the, the gas gradient and it's gonna go down like this, right? And that, that's my gas. So I got a hint here, there's a three zone heater. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be real tricky and we know that, well, let me get this thing over here. We're looking at the rate of reaction in chemistry is E to the KT. So this is the speed of the reaction, right? Basically or foundational part of it understanding. This is called the Arrhenius equation, right? So, what we're doing is if we kept a consistent heat, then we're dealing with this gradient of gas. This machine's fairly forgiven, like in nature wise that you would think that it wouldn't work out, but it actually does work. We're gonna do this. We're gonna have the heat. Let me, let me draw that thicker maybe. We're gonna have the heat like this And we're gonna have the heat countered. So as we go to the back end, we're gonna get hotter. We're hotter with less gas, but when we take the two together, they're the same thing. Does everybody see that? It'd be like if we would assign a figure to the gas at the beginning, maybe it's three and the heat is two. And then we flip them around and go like two and three. 
we're still getting like six. Does that make sense? And this is like a natural thing because we're just doing, it's not like a plasma where things are really funky in the fourth state of matter. Whole case that we don't have too many variables in here. So that's how we do it. So across the LPCVD, the batch is uniform. Well, that's not necessarily true. These, these ones here in the beginning, we put dummy wafers in. And then the end one, we put wafers in that we don't use like dummy wafers. They're a little bit funky, but in the middle here, they're pretty handy good. So the process ones are like in the middle and we might run five, you know, just dummy wafers at the ends. Does that make sense? So that's our solution. And that drawing with that balance of energy, the chemical energy and the heat and the mass, the flux of the gas, I think that's really neat. I think that's really neat. And when I look at engineering, how we apply energy has a lot to do with the final product. And I always use the example and think of this, you know, if you had some really good like prime rib and you were allocated so many kcals of energy or so many watts or so much temperature, and you took that nice, beautiful piece of prime rib and you put it in boiling water and pulled it out, it'd be like a piece of rubber toy for my dog to chew on. But if you took that same allocation of heat and had a nice, you know, charcoal grill all stoked up, put it in there, flipped it over, turned it once, it seared the outside and the inside was all nice and pink. Boy, my mouth is watering thinking about that. And we could potentially have the same amount of energy, right? But we applied it differently and our product was a lot different. So even just the concept of we can substitute plasma energy or lasers or heat or energy not in a short time or over a longer time, like making pulled pork or something like that. You know, that idea of energy to get work done is good, but how do we apply that energy? It's two different things. There is energy and energy allocation, so many watts or kcals or however you want to quantify that. But you know, how do you do that? I think it's like fairly artistic. So I like to pose those things to the students like, you know, we're just not screwing around here or going to school. This stuff's like, it's pretty neat, you know, like being a good violin player or something. You know, when you, when you, you know, when you look at it, there's just these layers of depth to understanding engineering and it's really cool. And not only that, it keeps you motivated because it's interesting, you know? So that's neat. That's an LPCVD. The nanowire one is the same thing. Isn't that interesting? Different materials, completely different 1D and 2D, but the hardware is really the same. So then the question that we're going to answer is what would be different? So this is a machine that we have in our lab and I wanted Oscar to go in today, but he has knee problems too. And, and we couldn't get in and, and make that. And we had some other guy and he had COVID issues and he was going to show you his tools. So that's a shame that we couldn't give you like a, a demo live or a tour, but you know, just things were against us and that's all you can do. But this is a machine that we can use for thin films or for nanowires. And this is the machine that we have in our lab. And you can get a, you can get an idea. There's like a 15 inch screen there. So I don't know that, that, I don't know that, I guess that tube, I think it's four foot long or something like that. And it's only for us, for research, it's only two inches wide, but that's the tool that we have in our lab that we make nanowires with. And I think I have pictures in here of nanowires that we made. The tool itself cost about $120,000. But with 
gas cabinets and toxic gas detectors, you easily go to a quarter million. And we had to have ours upgraded. And then we had like EPA, OSHA compliance. And then we put, we moved it. So then we had to go to the newest regulations. So I bet you we have $350,000 into that tool. And this will shock you and amaze you. The double wall gas tubings, because they have these real highly toxic, crazy gases in it, like silane. Those gas lines are tens, tens of thousands of dollars to put in for like 30 meters. It's crazy. Like to put in gas tube costs as much as a nice car. But all that liability and special welding equipment and all that other stuff. So that's jobs for students. You know, and, and that concept and that you have to have these things are really part of this discussion. You know, where are the jobs and what would you do? So working for a gas delivery company, selling gas cabinets, installing gas lines, being like a gas welder certified or whatever, those guys make some coin. Yeah. So this is what our system looks like. And when you flip it over, that picture in the upper right-hand column here, we can see on the, the top, that stuff looks like styrofoam, but it's more like an asbestos thing. Those are the three zones, the heater zones. And that's the gas tube. And I said like, this one's for research, but you wouldn't know it from the scale, but that tube's only two inches. And then down here in the bottom right-hand corner, those three red LEDs, those are the Eurotherm thermal controllers. And you control this all through software. And a lot of colleges teach lab view. And what you could do is you can go out and address like these temperature controllers or vacuum equipment, you know, sensors, and you write programs that you're the brains or, you know, the, the mind of the, the robot. And that's called lab view. And that's what this system runs on. So those are things to tell your students about too. Those are kind of neat things, that lab view. And those really teach you about, you know, the computer and architecture of the electronic design of systems. So, you know, those are valuable lessons when you look at a multi-million dollar tool. You're not going to go out and write a lab view program for a $5 million etch tool but you're really gonna be able to fix one or understand one or whatever when you made rudimentary things like this in your college. Or if a student came up to you and said, hey, what classes should I take? That lab you think's pretty cool. You know, so th those are good, you know, discussions within this presentation, you know? And so this is, you know, an image capture of the, the system that we have. So you can go from screen to screen, you're looking at, you know, your temperature control, your vacuum level, your gas input flow, and you, you know, you write these macros to do all that kind of stuff, the time that you spend to do a deposition, et cetera. So now let's look at, we went through the, the hardware, and if I had more time, I would have showed you the safety things like the gas detectors, the gas cabinets and all those things, but we, we don't have time today. Look at the clock. <clears throat> so we have another hour. So, so yeah, we're gonna get done in time, handy. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna contrast the two machines. So the first one we're gonna look at is the one that's more, has more economic impact because a lot of parts in your cell phone were made with this. I know in you know, your room, whatever room you're in, you probably have stuff that was deposited with CVD in that room. So it's, 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 it's fairly like real. For nanowires, I don't know. I don't know to say that. You know, I, I don't know if I can make that bet. So they're, they're, what we're gonna grow is thin films and then we can extend this into which we don't have time to, but they got what's called epitaxial reactors. 
And those would be things that would grow like lasers and things like that. So they're, they're like super slow CVD systems. And those, they would be called epi reactors. And those would be important for industries like lasers and, and, and solar cells, maybe. No, nah, not solar cells, more, more like lasers. But like somebody mentioned before that ALD is really cool too, you know. And ALD is a cousin of this. Like you, you take like, in some senses, you can take a CVD furnace and you just change the gas inlets and you got yourself an, a, 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 an ALD. So this, the, the hardware and, and really a lot of the concepts are, are super transferable to the ALD world. And in my note packet, the big note packet that I teach on this, I teach these notes that we're going over today, but then I teach LA, uh, ALD and MOCVD and, 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 and other subsets of this. But again, we don't have time today. So the, 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 the 2D film, the stuff for like sunglasses and prosthetic devices and things like that, we're going to call this the VS, the vapor to solid growth system. The length it takes for a time for a reaction to occur can be thought of as two ways, maybe, you know, abstractly when we're doing an examination. We can say it's limited by the available gas. That's called mass transport. And then you can say that it's available by the reaction rate, the kinetics, and that would be the heat or the available energy. Does that make sense? So, so that's the two rates of reaction. We're, we're gonna look at it basically by the mass transport or the kinetics, right? So th this is interesting how we're gonna grow things. And let me get my funky pen out here. Although I'm gonna show you this drawing again in some ways, but let me practice drawing because I'm so terrible at it. We can also look at this as, and that's supposed to be a straight line. We could look at this in like two different ways. We can say that I have like a, and I'll try to change the format here and Maybe let me do this. Can I do this? I don't know what this even is. Oh, this is my ad atom. Oh, I like that. So I, what happens here is when I have an ad atom, so I have these ad atoms floating around. And then it, oh, it always goes away, like this drawing thing. So I was doing this icon. So these are like my incoming like silane atoms and I want them to form on the surface. I could also look at them in another perspective. I could look at silicon as like group four and on each terminal end of, you know, the elect of the, you know, thing it has an electron. So there's like four electrons that are <clears throat> doing available to make a bond. So, you know, they're shaped like this or something. And there's electrons on each end, just because just it's easy to draw like silicon. But when we look at the surface itself, when I'm looking at the surface and let me go back to maybe blue, maybe I'll make it a different color blue. The surface itself has like a bond here and a bond here and a bond here and a bond here and a bond here. I'd like this, like this nose here, it'd be like Lincoln's face or something that I drew accidentally. That'd be pretty cool. I like that you see rocks and it looks like a big face or something and things are famous. So every once in a while there's a bond. Does everybody see that? In my incoming atoms like a puzzle piece. If I come down to the surface and this guy has like four bonds on it like this. If I come down, 
and I land in this area, this is actually going better than I thought it would. <laughs> so I'm tickled because I suck at drawing and it looks better than I thought it would. So I, I, I'm not kidding you. This is as good as it gets, but it's still terrible, but it delights me. So if I come down and I'm in this area right here, I can only make a bond like with one of these dudes. And because I have heat on the surface and it has like fair autonomy that it needs to lose energy to make, it needs to overcome like an energy barrier, like an energy hill. I probably can't lose energy there. So when the add atom comes down, let me change the color again. When the add atom comes down in this area, it'll probably come down and say, there's only one bond, I'm out of here. And seeing these areas over here that are like this area here that don't have much bonds in it, they're not that sexy. Does everybody see that? But then when this add atom here comes down into this area, it can make a bond here and a bond here. Whoops, it went away again. So this is looking really good. So basically what's gonna happen is, you try to go, what color was that? Like red kind of, red. And I was doing a draw thing in the icons. When I go over here, oh, I didn't do it. And I make my circle-y thing, I'm not in the right place. We're gonna pretend that that's touching the wall here. I made two bonds. So it'll probably stick in that area. Does everybody see that? So where I have these interfaces, when I'm in this zone, it's already, so we're gonna say blue is already a next level and white is the previous level. If I'm in this area, I don't have that many bonds and it doesn't look that good. And where I'm out here in this like wasteland over here, it doesn't look good to make a bond. But on these edges, they're looking dandy. So this grows like an onion. It grows in layers. Because if we give it enough time, it'll find where these energy traps are. Does everybody see that? And it'll fill in really good that you don't have defects on all these layers. So it's kind of like ALD. And then you go all the way. Now this thing disappeared again. I don't know why the cursor's disappearing. So you go all the way to this one where it's a good layer again. And then by chance, there's gonna be a defect. And then it starts all over again like this. And then you get another layer on the onion. Does everybody see that? If it, you do it too quick, it'll fill over those holes and it'll be like Swiss cheese. Maybe we want that because the wood's gonna be like balsa wood, really lightweight, but balsa wood's not that strong or pine. But if we were usually trying to make things by like an allotrope or by analogy, like oak or mahogany, real dense. And that's what we're going with here. Does everybody see that? especially on a nanoscale, because things are kind of small. So small things, you want to make them as robust as possible. But this is how thin films grow. How about that? They grow a layer at a time, like onion. And the reason, if you give them enough time, they're filling in, excuse me, these energy traps. So this is how thin films grow. So this is, this is more of a technical look at that. So what we have is the add atom, which is the atom we want to add to the surface. It comes down to the surface and it usually has like a, it comes down in like a wheelbarrow. It's stabilized, for example, like silicon would have hydrogen on it. And the hydrogen is like a temporary bond, but it's making it a, a gas, not a solid. But when it hits the surface, we could lose that hydrogen and just have that precipitate of that silicon as an additive add atom. So when the first, when this molecule per se comes down, this add atom molecule matrix comes down to the surface like a ping pong ball, it's gonna hit the surface and it doesn't make a chemical bond or lose that much energy, but it's an intimate contact 
with some energy like van der Waals forces. So basically, the let me put my cell phone up here in this bottle cap. That'll be my tax deductible teaching aid. And, and this was $1,000, so that'll help me on taxes this year. So the, the, the ad atom comes down and it doesn't stick, but it's kind of like in that surface. So it'll ride along there and it's looking for an energy pothole. But then it doesn't find one and it's hot and it just leaves. That happens in about 10 to the minus 12 seconds. When it goes down and it's trapped by Van der Waals forces and it's scooting across the surface, that's called phys absorption. So it's physically through Van der Waals forces, kind of like riding on the surface. Then it's doing surface diffusion because it's hot. And it's moving around. And when it finds like single bonds, it's like, no, that's not good for me. It's not good enough for me. I need two bonds. So it finds one bond. And it's like, nah, that's not good enough. I'm out of here. Then it comes back later and it says, oh, here's two or three bonds. And then what it'll do, those two or three bonds have enough chemical barrier, enough energy that it'll actually be incorporated into the film and it'll lose that energy or convert those bonds. So that's when it's chem absorbed. And it's really chem absorbed where there's these energy trenches. Does everybody see that? And this is again, helping us form a uniform cohesive film. So these are the six steps that happen. So these add atoms, they diffuse to the surface. They come down and they adsorb. Absorb means you brings it in, right? So like I drink this water, that's ab absorb. Adsorb is maybe I took too many Oxycontin today for my knee and I go like this and I spill it over here and it goes on my shirt. Does everybody see that? So that would be adsorb that's on the surface. Does everybody see that? But this, this adsorb means that it's on the surface. And it's looking for a bond and it's looking for good bonds. So then what it's going to do is it's going to find areas that are like islands and it's going to nucleate and grow on those islands. So that's this. See, we have these islands that are growing together, like Pangea kind of stuff, right? Like all the earth form kind of things, you know, the continents and stuff spread apart. So these things are forming together. And, and how they're forming is the one that has priority or the areas that have the most bonds. And interestingly, there's like screw dislocations that the next bond is like on a thread like this. And that's how like roses grow and seashells. And a lot of things in nature grow like rotini noodles, you know, pasta noodles. So they grow like that because each little step is the next step. And then when you make that step, it's the next step. So they grow like threads on a screw. So that's how you see like seashells grow when you look at them. They're growing like that. That's because that was the most. So nature grows like that. So that's how this is growing. And then this is the rate limiting steps. The rate limiting steps are interesting because people often don't talk about this and it, it's very important. The substrate itself, we have the add atom has the energy, right? But we looked at the substrate and they have bonds. So for example, if I took silicon, let me draw again here. And I'll just do red. I think that'll show up nice. If I took silicon, it, it's made out of stuff like this. Like these silicon bonds. But if I did something like ran sandpaper on there or argon bombardment, then I'd get even like, it'd be like rough. 
and then even more bonds on top of bonds on stuff. So I could actually take this material like silicon and as it comes, I have this many bonds, but I could do something like plasmas or sand it or roughen it up. And I would have more bonds per unit area over here when I roughen it up. So this is case number B, even though it's the same piece of silicon, I did some treatments and I roughened it up, there's more surface area. This one is gonna deposit faster because it has more energy. It has more nooks and crannies. So the accommodation factor, how you treat the material will control the growth rate. This has implications not only in CVD, this is my implant in my leg. This area over here, oh, my thing went away. I can't see where I'm at now. Over here in A, this might be the part of my knee like this that I don't want things to grow on because I don't want to be like the Tin Man. But over here, I might want to roughen up the surface so bone can adhere to it. So that's the part of the prosthetic that's up in my leg, up in my femur. So the same piece of titanium, we changed the accommodation coefficient or the reactivity of the material so that it behaves differently. So the accommodation coefficient is the bonds that are available on the surface. And we can change that by surface treatments. So as we do higher pressures and VS growth and faster, you generally get with heat, you get more defects. So we control that, those recipes, so that we get the appropriate amount of defects. And this is a surface reaction. And I, I just pointed this, this isn't like, for this type of hand waving presentation, it's not that necessary, but I, I thought that it's cool to tell a story like the add atoms are, you know, like on your surface, it's like somebody got a bucket full of, of, of ping pong balls and they're just bouncing up and down, trying to find the right area. And the time that it's doing that surface diffusion, I gotta move here. Oh. The, the time that it's doing that surface diffusion is like 10 to the minus 12 seconds and then it leaves. And there's a nice equation for you. So that's, that's the, this is the surface reaction time. So this stuff is happening, well, certainly in my world, instantaneous. I can't even fathom, except on paper and math, you know, and on a computer, and, you know, do the homework on it, right? So 10 to the minus 12, it's just a number like in mathematics or whatever, but Really, I don't even know what 10 to the minus 12 means. 12 zeros is too much for me to comprehend physically. Like I know I'm not looking out at the mountain there and there's not 10 to the 12 leaves on the trees and I can't even grasp how many there are there. You know, so that number to me is just like crazy big, you know, so that, that's neat. And this is a classic drawing. Of the reaction. So when we're in the fizzy absorbed, like the van der Waals, as that ad atom is sliding across the surface, it's at a higher energy state because it has potential energy from the chemical reaction that isn't used yet. But then when it finds some really good bonds, it could give up that chemical reaction and we can see that it's chem absorbed. So if you would like, you know, have a cup of tea or something and stare at this drawing, you could see that, you know, how the energy is transferring. And you could also be in some way satisfied that we made this chemical bond. Does everybody see that? So then we're all happy with that. And this shows us, you know, this is just a drawing, but it shows us if I would look at my crazy poor drawing technique, you know, if I would look over here, there's not that many bonds. 
But if I'd look in this corner, there's a bond here, a bond here, and a bond down in the bottom. So when an add atom comes down, it's really likely to form in this area or in this corner, or certainly in this hole. And not so much out here, but yeah, here, because there's one here on the side and one on the bottom. So according to what available energy you have, that changes in some sense is the local accommodation coefficient, the likelihood that we're gonna have a chemical reaction at that point. So I think that that's cool. So this, this is that screw dislocation that I talked about. So a lot of things in nature grow like this. So it, it adds an atom in that efficient place and then that begets the next atom. So it's one step. So I think that's really neat, you know? So this, this is an examination and a lot of things grow like this. And then if you take, you know, material engineering, you know, college or, and certainly grad level material engineering, you know, looking at these screw dislocations and, and uh, you know, uh, additions and how nanowires grow and stuff, it's really neat. So advantages of LCD films, they're, they're really uniform, like a, a conformal piece of saran wrap. Uh, they can do large substrate capacity, right? We can put 100 in a machine. We can have a variety of materials that we can use to deposit. And then we can, the, the CVD E to the KT, it's fairly forgiving. You know, it's, it, it, it's not like unexpected things that you would have in other types of processes, contrasting other things, you know, unnamed things. So it's pretty good. So it's certainly more controllable and less surprises than the cousin of it, which is PECVD. The disadvantage is certainly the top one is higher temperature and it's a low deposition rate, although the big thing is the time that it takes to heat up and cool down a process. So maybe that's really not an issue. Overall, the process is ours, but because we're doing hundreds of substrates at a time, potentially, that kind of goes away. And then there's maintenance and particles and vacuum and contamination. And so they have its issues, but it's really good and it's used a lot. So th these, these negative issues are accepted and dealt with. So the last one we're going to do today is nanowires. And what this is, is called the VLS process. So VLS, the magic to this, which I told you before is, we have the wafer a substrate and we locally put down a catalyst. And that catalyst is like a nanometer gold droplet shot like a polka dot across the wafer. And when we look at this, we heat the catalyst and it actually kind of like melts into with intimate contact to the substrate. A nanotechnology trivia is when you're at the nano scale, like a 60 nanometer droplet of gold, it doesn't melt at 1063 like regular gold does. It might melt at 400 degrees C. So at a lower temperature, we can have our nano droplets, that gold melt and become a liquid but still a droplet locally on the wafer. Does that make sense? And now that's the catalyst. So what happens is we melt it. See, I can see my cursor right now. So I have my gold droplet on the surface, I heat it. And now my gold droplet is wet on the surface. It's wet on the surface. If we look at this, the gold itself is literally intimate with the bonds on the surface. So I'll say that again. The gold is really in two regimes. The gold the gold that's up here 
that interfaces with the gas in the vacuum. The gold that's done in here, it's now bond communication with the surface. These little blue dots are the silicon hydrogen gas, silane. Ooh, it's, it's a four, sorry. I don't know why, maybe SiO2, I don't know why I drew a two, but it's SiH4. So that comes in, it's hotter, like 400 degrees. At 250 degrees, hydrogen doesn't like to stick around. So hydrogen, will go out as a byproduct. And the gold becomes, this right here is a gold and silicon alloy. That's the gold with the blue dots. Is everybody hip? At some point, I'm going to take in so much silicon that I'm going to become super saturated and have an overabundance of energy. That's shown here. I have a lot of energy. So now my silicon that's in that alloy wants to like lose some energy. It could go back out into the gas, which takes a tremendous amount. It's a big energy barrier. It can't do that. But it looks down, there's like, oh, it's all these bonds down here. There's bonds down on the floor. So then it starts taking these silicon and growing bonds to the pre existing silicon. So the silicon goes down, finds this area here because this is an area that has a lot of bonds. And then it keeps on growing up. That surface is like 100 or what, like Miller indices it's going to have a cadence and it's going to grow like that screw dislocation. If it's 100 or 111. And it'll continue to grow up in this direction as long as we apply gas because the gas has a choice to go out here, which is too much energy, or put down another layer. So the wire continues to grow up defined by the catalyst. And the catalyst, by definition, makes the process faster, but doesn't get used up in the process. Then we can look at, we can go back and look at, if I look at the area over here, when this comes down, it bounces off because there's not enough bonds. So the area adjacent to the catalyst doesn't have enough energy to do chem absorption. But with this intermediate catalyst, the gold catalyst as an intermediate VL liquid interface S as this intermediate catalyst, it has enough, it's energy favorable that it's gonna, it's gonna integrate or grab the silicon out of the gas and push it down to the bottom where there's all these bonds, bonds that are easily made. So therefore the wire just grows up. And you control the diameter of the wire by the diameter of the gold dot. And you control this rotation by our parent template, which would be like our Miller indices, our bond population. So we could have a, we could have a surface like this. And if it were silicon, and, and I don't know, this is like necessarily true. So I'm just giving an example. 
I could have one set of silicon that has bonds like this and it's real dense. And then some other Miller indices that I only have one bond. So these are the template. So over here, there's a lot of dudes. So maybe this will grow up like with a tight spiral. And then this one will be like, I'm sorry, I can't draw, but slower. Does everybody see that? But my point is the, the surface itself here acts as the template, like this packing ratio or whatever you want to call it. That's going to control this spiral. So, you know, one that has a lot of pack is going to be like this. One that's looser is probably going to turn slower. Is everybody seeing that? And then that has implications in what sensors you're going to make and all that other kind of stuff. So that, that's how you make a nanowire. I think they should have better. So this just says, you know, gold melts 1063, but it's when it's on a nanoscale, maybe we could melt it like 400 degrees or something. And then that's gonna be where, where the, the, the deposition would occur and, and it would make the nanowire at that, that temperature. We can put on different ways of nano, like the catalyst. And one of the neat ways is we can etch into the surface because we can control the etch pattern with lithography. Then we can deposit gold across the whole thing and then buff it down. And then we could have these localized regions. And this is called the Damascene process, which is important. But that's from Damascus, like Syria. And what you would do is you could get like uh, what they did back in the day, because Syria, Damascus was a trading location they would do things like art. So a guy would get like a piece of metal, chisel into it and then pond gold into it. And then you'd make like a picture that would have like a beagle in it and a pheasant or something like that. They do that on shotguns. And they put like oak leaves, gold oak leaves on like Walther pistols and stuff like that. And they put, you know, beagles and, and grouse and stuff on well beagles would be more Brittany kind of thing i mean a, a britney is more of a grass kind of thing on like a beretta shotgun you know they'll pond that in and that's that's like a jewelry technique but they, they you use that on the the nanoscale that same technique and they from that from borrowed from that damascus that they would do that particular uh, patterning technique, and you could have really well-defined nano wires, like for solar cells or something like that. So that's really neat. So Damascus process is a bonus. And then how do you choose a catalyst to grow different wires? Well, you go to periodicals and you can look it up, right? So for a different catalyst, you can grow different nano wires. So for silicon gold is like the dude, and if I wanted to do, you know, whatever gallium nitride, I might use nickel or something, right? And these are uh, nanowires that we grew in our LPCVD that I showed you there, the Automate. We had students do this. I don't know what year I had this, 2009, I guess it says, that I had the student, as their project, they, they made nanowires and did a report on nanowires. And those are pictures we took with our SEM and stuff. Oh, at the nanofaber. So we could also use this. Yeah, this is in here. We could use like silicon nanowires, like a mesh, as like scaffolding and put that on a wound. And then it would give you something for the, or would give fiber blasts an area to anchor onto to initiate healing. So that's interesting. And this is from 2007. And so this has probably been in the notes a while. My daughter does this same kind of thing, which is crazy. She's getting her second doctor degree. She makes uh, polymers that do neural regeneration in spinal columns. So any questions here, guys? What do you guys think? What do you say? What do you say you think? So I'm done. So I think the real key here is, is we were contrasting an area 
that had a uniform accommodation coefficient or uniform energy. And that was for VS. But when we went to VLS, what we did is we made one area a little bit better looking. So the rate of reaction was quicker there. In fact, we, we set it up so that the rate of reaction where there was no catalyst, there is no reaction. And there's a reaction where the catalyst exists. And I think that that's, you know, really neat and logical, you know? I think it's nice, nice idea and a nice functionalized idea. So that's the basic idea between VS and VLS. The first nanowires were seen shortly after like World War II in one of the first SEMs. And they didn't know what they were or why they grew. So that was interesting. And the papers like typewritten, you know, on the original papers and that they did, you know, their research and, and how that grew. So they discovered nanowires, you know, when they were able to see them with one of the first SEMs. So they did that work. As far as I know, the initial work was done at Bell Labs here in the United States. But I'm sure it was done probably almost simultaneously in Russia and England and all those things were done really quickly. A lot of smart people working all over the world post-World War II. All right, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Tar. Thanks everyone right. for attending. Take Everybody care. have a nice weekend. Be careful. Bye-bye.